Hello and welcome to Round Table. The Franco-German relationship has been at the heart of the European project, but that alliance is falling apart. The French president, Emmanuel Macron, has said Berlin risks, as he puts it, isolating itself. Well, Paris and Berlin are on opposing sides on energy, inflation and defence. And on a personal level, there appears to be no chemistry between President Macron and the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz. Can the two sides bridge this divide? Very good to have you along. I'm David Foster. The alliance between France and Germany is under strain as weeks of disagreements over fighter jets and energy plans lead to divergent policies on key areas of European cooperation. The German Chancellor and the French President were all smiles last week in a meeting in Paris to mend some of those ties. But will attempts to decrease tensions succeed at a time when unity is vital for the bloc? With me in the studio, I'm pleased to welcome Joseph Downing, Senior Lecturer in International Relations at Aston University, an expert in French politics and security. We say hello to in Paris, Anne-Elizabeth Moutet, journalist and political commentator, and in Bath, Alim Balach, lecturer in German politics and society at the University of Bath. Welcome to all three of you. I was struck, Anne-Elizabeth, by the fact that you said the relationship is the pits at the moment. Why is it so very, very bad? There are many reasons, but there's a feeling in France that uh, the uh, alliance between the, Briti the uh, Germans and the French, which meant that uh, any kind of action was taken together or at least prepared in advance, has, has fallen through. And there are many, many statements and many decisions that have been taken by the German government, by Chancellor Scholz, uh, on which France was not even warned. Uh, the Prague speech last week, uh, in which Germany laid out uh, a, a logic of a sort of driving Europe more to the east, for instance, was something that had not even been taken into account uh, and not, had not been sent to be read uh, by, by, by the French. And there's a number of other choices from Germany, including on, on the German uh, a cap for energy prices uh, and uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, 200 million plan. Uh, to 200, sorry, billion euro uh, plan uh, uh, to, to uh, st stimulate the German economy that the French react very badly to. Ali, let me ask you, uh, Anne Elizabeth is hinting at the fact that France's nose was put out of joint by what Chancellor Schultz had done, didn't say, didn't give any warning. Would Angela Merkel have done the same thing or not? Would it have been very different? Well, I don't think it's as so much a matter of personality. It seems to me that in this case, the diplomats and civil servants lost control of their politicians. I mean, this should have been properly communicated at the um, you know, mid-level diplomatic channels. And this is where you um, negotiate and then you let the politicians do the performative display of finalizing the negotiations. But you clear up what is the scope for, um, for agreements. So it's nothing to do with the fact that Emmanuel Macron may regard Olaf Scholz as an upstart new chancellor who's trying to throw his weight around. Yeah, I mean, what we see is remarkable in the sense that since World War II, it was uh, so important to have this display of Franco-German friendship for Germany in particular. This was the cornerstone of German re-socialization after World War II, and you had it regardless whether there was a conservative leader here and a social democratic leader there, they would even more so celebrate the, the, the friendship. You had Kohl and Mitterrand holding hands. You had this performative friendship between Giscard d'Estaing and, and Schmidt. You had uh, Chirac even uh, representing Germany at a EU, EU council meeting when Gerhard Schröder couldn't make it. So um, this was probably the high point of, of this, this uh, celebration of the Franco-German alliance. And the fact that Macron is now publicly, more or less publicly, um, uh, showing his, his petulance and irritation, that is quite remarkable. 
Jesse, what, what do you think about this? I mean, I'm sure it can't come down to simply the fact that a few civil servants made a couple of diplomatic errors. There must be something more fundamental to it. Well, I, I, th I, think, I think France and Germany, in a sense, for a long time, have pulled in quite different directions, right? So, on the security issues, France has been much more keen in some ways on, on a European army, Macron. The French have been more suspicious of NATO, even pulling out at a particular point. Macron has spoken about a European army. They've pulled in that direction, whereas the Germans have already, you know, significant US bases on their soil. We've seen this recently in the German procurement of um, fifth generation F-35 fighter jets from the US. The French are not happy about that. Because they, they wanted the Germans Europe. to come in in developing a, a, a Franco-German... Precisely. Precisely, but which wouldn't have been ready before, you know, 2030s, right? So, you know, they, they, they have pulled in, in, in quite differing directions for actually quite some time. But as the previous commentators have said, they, they, they've generally presented a united public front. But I think some of it does come down to leadership styles, right? So Schultz isn't Merkel. Schultz doesn't have that charisma domestically or internationally, I don't think. Macron is... But if you have less charisma than Muti, who didn't seem to show an awful lot of charisma herself, mm. that is saying something, isn't it? Well, yeah, but we're in a different time, I think, right? So we have a continuity candidate in a time of discontinuity, right? So we have someone that came in sort of promising to, to continue the sort of um, the, 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 the previous Chancellor Merkel's policy stances, but we're in a very different era. Overnight, things changed, right? 24th of February, the order was upended, especially for Germany, because of the energy dependence in such a significant way. I think it, it, it caught Schultz off guard and actually proves many of the naysayers, including figures such as Donald Trump, right, who criticized German foreign policy for some decades, it proved that they actually had a point. I, I'm just wondering whether, in fact, um, it's his lack of charisma that is an issue or whether, in fact, a, a, a more Gallic German leader, if you like, Ali, would have, would have been better or whether Macron, and this is for you as well, Elizabeth, would have seen that as more of a challenge rather than somebody who may be a little bit dull, a little bit boring. Ali? I mean, what I can grant you is that, um, because you want to go down this personality path, but it is important, isn't it, that we, that we Schultz, study who at the top is making decisions and why the two men themselves may well not get on. Yeah. So Scholz does have an issue right now. He is um, increasingly seen at home in Germany as very irritable. Um, he's lacking patience. Um, the way he, um, he, was, he was heckled, just for example, by climate activists. Um, and he responded by saying that this reminded him of a very dark uh, episode in German's history uh, uh, when there were these performative um, um, activists, uh, and, and, and many people felt reminded of um, of the... Uh, they saw it as a comparison to the Nazi past, right? And Scholz later said, well, I didn't mean it, but he didn't clarify what he meant. Then he accused um, climate activists of lacking creativity and that their performances were boring. So he seems very irritable. And um, yes, you can certainly say he lacks charisma, but I mean, um, Merkel did not start her chancellorship as a very charismatic person, right? So she was mocked before she became chancellor and people um, said well, she's completely lacking charisma. And then she later built this charisma by being this uh, calm and um, and and down to earth um, and, and, and um, and uh, purposefully boring politician. I wonder, Anne Elizabeth, will respond to the question I threw out there, first of all, but I, I wonder whether, in fact, it's that both Germany and France, the powerhouses of the European Union over the decades, feel that the EU should be something different to each other. But that, that's to follow up after you've responded to what you've just heard. Well, I would agree that there certainly is a, is, is a personal problem because Emmanuel Macron likes uh, creating what he believes are personal relationships with um, uh, various leaders, and it doesn't always work. We've seen this with Putin. But there's also the fact that the interests of France and the interests of Germany do not seem as aligned as they have been in the past. And you can say that they were aligned because there was it was a carefully maintained balance. Uh, but... Now it's sort of all coming apart. And there's one thing that's really ang that angers the French is that whenever the um, Germany, the German army, which now is going to spend quite a great deal 
on, on sort of upgrading its military equipment, which is a huge decision by Chancellor Schultz, for instance. They are buying American planes. They're buying American uh, uh, stuff. I mean, they're building themselves, panzers and cannons, but still, they are buying from the Americans. And the French feel that having been uh, let down, for instance, by the German Air Force 20 years ago, when they suddenly decided not to order the military cargo plane Airbus 400M, uh, and that really meant scuppering the project, essentially, they feel that Germany has constantly not been a good partner to France within the European alliance of aerospace. That's one thing. And the, the idea that there should be a sort of separate aerospace industry for the EU and that aerospace industry is uh, uh, upgraded uh, technically uh, by the research that it does for military aircraft, for instance, so that it's, it's, you, you can't really have a large a country that has a good aerospace industry without the, the marriage between military and, and civilian and, and space exploration, which is state. That is, that is something that is really resented. There's also the fact that Germany has decided, taken a number of economic decisions that the French feel are very selfish, uh, and especially if you if you look at, for instance, the fact that there's this obsession, which many analysts now say uh, is has come from a relentless Russian and Soviet propaganda over the last 40 years to completely drop nuclear plants, uh, even though they are carbon neutral. Uh, and uh, now Germany has started complaining. They buy electricity from France because they don't produce enough electricity. And even with the coal plants, even with, with uh, uh, you know, things that are much more carbonated. But uh, the, the, the fact that they have uh, uh, complained about France, uh, some French nuclear plants being uh, uh, maintained and therefore not producing electricity, is seen as France's infernal goal. Uh, how, you, know, you, you, you say all sorts of things about the nuclear industry and sabotage the image of the nuclear industry and do not use it and reopen strip mining in Germany. And then you, you challenge that our plants should, should produce more. And it, it, there's a feeling that the, uh, the current, the, uh, what, what used to be the sort of smooth relationship between French and German diplomats is completely now uh, uh, disappearing. And the impulsion does not probably come from the diplomatic okay. core of Germany, so it comes from the Chancellery. Okay, I, I'm, I'm just wondering, Joseph, I mean, respond to this if you'd like to first, but the, the thought occurs to me that um, what we're seeing here is, is France believing that Germany is no longer playing by the rules of the club, that it's going its own particular way. That's upsetting because France thinks that upsets the equilibrium within, within, within Europe. Is that just... Um, an assumption, or is that actually true, that Germany is actually playing outside? De no, 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 definitely. And, and the specifics of the German case, I think, in, in the face of the current crisis, necessitate that they do so, unfortunately, right? They're very dependent, they were very dependent on Russian gas. But I think behind the scenes, we are seeing a tip, we are seeing a change in the balance of power between France and Germany. We see Germany facing a massive democratic demographic issue with an aging population, a shrinking workforce, pension system under stress. We see France, the population is actually growing, fertility rates higher. And very and actually, young demographic. Very, very young demographic. And we can see this de demographic and industrial uh, um, balance actually shifting in the French, in, in, in the favour of France. So, you know, we, ha we have a lot of contextual issues, I think, behind the scenes that, that, that are pushing um, both. So, if you like, it's the directions. older generation versus the younger generation. In, 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 if, if you want to describe it that way, but it's, it's, it's two different types of people. Yeah. Well, I, th I think also, I mean, I think the French have been proved right in, in their energy policy, in their insistence on, 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 you know, going big on nuclear and stuff like that. They've gone down a path which has benefited them and Germany has done the reverse. And does that rankle with the Germans? Well, I think it might. I think it does, actually. Yeah, because I, I, I think it's, it's... They were very confident because you've got to understand there's, there's a bigger ideological question here. Germany didn't just trade with Russia because it was it was cheap and you could get cheap gas. It, it was part of a sort of liberal peace hypothesis that we can rein in Russian aggression and Russian, you know, um, boisterousness by building trade into dependence. And it's been an absolute failure. We've just seen, you know, 24th of February, everything changed. 30, 40 years of, of, of German foreign policy was proved wrong. Let's... Um look at how dangerous or not this, this might be. And I'm going to throw in a quote from Ursula von der Leyen, uh, talking as president of the European Commission without mentioning Germany uh, by name. 
without a common European solution, we seriously risk fragmentation. So it's paramount that we preserve a level playing field for all in the European Union in the single market. Is there a possibility, Ali, that this could prove to be very dangerous to the EU project as a whole? And I'm talking specifically about the 200 billion euro package that Germany is going to pay to its people when the rest of Europe is saying, hang on, we need to act together. You're doing this alone and that's, that's dangerous. Yes. I mean, listen, France does have a point that national responses lead to a cacophony of like incompatible energy policies. On the other hand, Germany also has a point that lots of other EU countries have uh, made similar announcements. Mark Rutte even came to Germany's defense, the, 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 um, um, uh, the Dutch, Dutch PM, yeah. um, for the very same reason. But again, France, on the other hand, has a point that Germany has a particular responsibility just because Germany is such a huge economy and um, a 200 billion package is, ex is extremely impactful. And therefore, there should be a stronger consultation. Um, so, but we have, we have more than just the 200 billion. We have um, the general question, should there be a, a, a cap on gas prices in the internal market? Germany is opposed to it. Um, Germany is advocating a, a pipeline from Spain through France. France is not having it. And um, yeah, so we have Macron, who is, uh, he, he remembers the Yellow Vest movement, which was largely uh, motivated at, in the beginning by um, energy prices, right? And now energy prices are spiraling out of control, potentially. And he sees Scholz coming to the rescue of the, of the German uh, consumers, um, although we have to say the 200 billion package is still kind of vague how it will operate. We will have to wait and see. But uh, can, can I just ask this one question? Oh, how, how is it that the German spending German money on German people is going to distort the market elsewhere in Europe? Because if Monsieur Macron wanted to, President Macron wanted to, he could presumably do the same to a, to a greater or lesser extent. I don't know whether he has no money left and Elizabeth, or, or whether in fact he has some, because presumably Germany also doesn't have a great deal in the bank, given that uh, that seems to apply to most of us at the moment. But but why is he distorting the market, Scholz? Um, why did the French see it that way, where they could do the same thing? Well, first of all, it is perfectly true that France doesn't have much money left to spend, and the way we spent it was not directed enough. Is essentially you got from the time of the yellow vest, which was before COVID, which was before the war in Ukraine, uh, which was before the the, the uh, you know the beginning of inflation. You've got you know when you've got people complaining bitterly outside the parliamentary system in the streets. Uh, what the result is that they get given, you know, one dollop here, one dollop there. And in the end, if you add up several years, it's not 200 billion euros, but it certainly is 100 million billion euros, which is many we haven't got. France has gone I and mean, it has explo exploded the, the Maastricht criteria in which you are not supposed to have uh, a debt that was more than 3% of GDP. And we now are sort of reaching almost 6%. Germany for years has told us we have to be responsible. During the financial crisis of 2008, it bore down on places like Spain and Greece uh, because they were in debt. And, and suddenly Germany is sort of entirely distorting the market. It's distorting the market for gas because it means that it will mechanically rise, raise the price of gas for the entire continent. But it's distorting, distorting the general economy. And there's a the sort of the word that's being used in Paris is selfishness. So France is perhaps just a little bit jealous that Germany has the cash and it's making its citizens not so badly off. And France can't do this and it's sour grapes. Well, the thing is, that there's quite a different energy mix, right? So gas is really central to Germany. But Macron did intervene in terms of, uh, of nationalising EDF and telling EDF they have to fix price rises. I think it was about 4%. So he has intervened quite significantly. Another, another, another issue that's wrangled a lot with European partners is the reluctance of Germany to equip Ukraine, right? They seem to sit on the fence when they do send um, weapons, especially at the start, they were of poor quality. So, you know, there, there are a number of issues here, I think, which is which Okay, is all, all the of these are grievances, but why do they all add up to perhaps the biggest Franco-German problem uh, for the last, well, since mm. shortly after the Second World War? But why, why do they all add up to be so 
possibly damaging? Because I think the, the, the context has changed so greatly, and I think things do add up, right? Because they it's need the... to be close because of the existential threat to, to Ukraine and European mm. solidarity? Yeah, yeah, I think so. How do they bridge that, then? Okay, it's difficult. It becomes quite difficult. I mean, I, I don't think in the short to medium term until... I mean, Germany has a lot of uh, liquefied natural gas terminals coming online at, towards the end of 2023, right? I think this will stabilise European energy markets, and I think th uh, at that point... I think the, the bridges can be more easily rebuilt, but I think for the next six to nine months, it's going to be quite and difficult. And the danger is, if they're not rebuilt, what? Well, the, the, then, then the energy crisis continues, right? You know, they have to find a replacement supply. And LNG from places like Qatar, from the US, is going to be an important way to do that. OK. Um, Aline, what do you want to say about it? How, how do you think it could be fixed? Well, you need proper consultation and, and, and compromise. So we cannot have public displays of, of, of um, irritation between Germany and, 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 and France. So there, there is scope for a European solution. So in that sense, I agree with France. We need a, a European-wide policy. I understand the concerns of uh, Ursula von der Leyen. And this could definitely tear Europe apart if we see um, a massive further inflation, which I hope is not going to happen over the winter. Um, uh, I would, but, but tear it apart in what way? Yeah. Because I mean, we've got a block of nearly thirty countries. We've had seventy years um, since the end of the Second World War. Um, there hasn't been anything that has threatened to destroy the European Union, but yet now you're saying that this could. How how would it how would it do that? Well, Scholz is very concerned about uh, creating the appearance that the German taxpayer is um, milked by um, by Europe, by the entire uh, um, European Union. This is a very popular topos in, in right-wing uh, German um, uh, narratives. Uh, it, it has been rewarmed a couple of times, so he desperately wants to avoid that. At the same time, we have countries struggling, um, their economies are, are on the brink, of, and uh, this could include Italy. So um, there are a lot of European member states that are not doing well, and um, there's something has to give. Ironic, perhaps, that Germany's complaining that it's giving the EU too much, and it's seen as central, and Elizabeth, to the, to the European project, when, in fact, that was exactly the same argument used by Margaret Thatcher um, and Boris Johnson and led to Britain pulling out of the European Union. Um, is it possibly a fact that France has to have somebody within Europe to ostentatiously, if you like, dislike? If it wasn't the Germans right now, it was the British last week and so on. I think it's nice and it's funny, but it's not true. I think what was really important in the, in the French-German alliance, especially in the first uh, two decades of the EU, was that you had one powerful industrial nation that brought the riches and after reunification population. And you had a political behemoth that was France also, you know, inheriting from the Gaul uh, an important political importance within the union. And what we're really seeing is a sort of redistribution of the map uh, now that Europe is 27 states with the east, uh, the eastern states, central and eastern Europe are showing now political will and political determination. And this is and, and unity, uh, except for Hungary, on, on, on the question of Ukraine. Uh, and even though Germany is now looking more commercially at Eastern Europe, as it always did, uh, what's fascinating is how different the, uh, the political uh, position of Germany is from the position of, all of, the, uh, uh, of, of Eastern Europe from Baltics to the Balkans. Uh, that is fascinating in itself. OK, in I'm going to go to Joseph because we've got about a minute and a half left. France is unlikely um, to look upon anything that Germany is doing at the, at the precise moment fondly unless Germany changes, and Germany isn't going to change. So the status quo remains. What, how dangerous is that? Um, well, I mean, this is the thing, right? And, and I think it hints at uh, a, a sort of partly to, if we look at the thing like def defence procurement, um, an uneasiness in France that they're not making the... the they're not, they're not gaining ground in a way that they would hope to, right? So traditionally, for fighter jets, for example, France has sold mainly off the European continent, whereas the NATO allies have brought, either from the Eurofighter programme or from the US, 
And I think that this hints at their uneasiness about their, their lack of being able to gain ground in, as they would like to see themselves as, you know, Europe's key security player. But it highlights the dangers of the fact that every country has its own national vested interests and they aren't, don't always marry up with exactly what, what is okay, yeah. seen for the block. Completely, and, and that's, uh, as our other contributor said, right, that's where you need negotiation, that's where you need consensus. But I think that the, the time we are in is so remarkable and, and has represented such a huge shift in so many different areas of, of, of policy and economics that that has become increasingly difficult. It's much easier to negotiate when inflation's not at 10%. I suppose one of the <laughs> things I should have actually asked you, maybe we'll do this in a different programme, is, is how other people are trying to exploit these differences mm. at the moment, given what's happening in Ukraine. Listen, thank you very, very much indeed. I'm sure we'll return to the subject time and time again, the togetherness or otherwise of the European Union in uncertain times. Thank you very much for watching this edition of Roundtable from me, David Foster, and the team. Until next time, goodbye.